Hey there, and welcome to the Flow and Flourish podcast. I am your fantabulous host, the Capacity Coach, Nicole Roan, and I am thankful that you are in the place today. Can you believe that we're already in the middle of April? I mean, give or take a few days, but like we are midway through this first month of Q2, and I cannot believe how fast time is going. But the good news is that we're talking all about financial literacy, stress management, and a handful of other awarenesses on the podcast this month. And if this is your very first time here, then hey, sis, welcome. Welcome to your new tribe, the place where we talk openly and honestly about all of the things that come with being the one in our friend and family circles really being able to manage our personal and our professional lives and juggling all the hats, all the different priorities and everything that comes with that. So here you'll get all kind of tips, tools, strategies, all the resources you need to really be able to flow and flourish effortlessly in every single part of your life. If you have been here since the beginning and have listened to all the episodes or you've just started to listen and you've come back, thank you. Seriously, thank you so much for coming back, continuing to listen, supporting, getting what you need to practice self-care on every single level. Thank you again for tuning in. Because April is so full of different awarenesses, I have started to talk a little bit about financial awareness, stress awareness, or stress management in general. And today I'm going to be talking about something that is a little bit heavier, but that it needs to be discussed. And it's talking about the undiscussed or underdiscussed, undermentioned, however you want to look at it. Talking about the epidemic of alcoholism. Now, it's no secret that alcoholism has had a significant impact in my life because my husband was an alcoholic and actually he just made two years sober on April 11th and I'm super proud of him and I would be lying if I said that he wasn't part of the inspiration for this, but it's also because when I was going through what I was going through with him, there wasn't a whole lot of information that really helped me as someone who was trying to help someone who suffered from alcoholism. And so I really just want to put all of this out here to bring awareness because I know that I am not the only person who has been impacted by alcoholism. And so before I get into today's episode, I do want to let you know that today's episode is being brought to you by... The Art of Flow, which is my signature 12-week individual one-on-one coaching program. This program is for you if you are really looking to design a life that meets your terms. I help you over the course of 12 weeks to create and implement boundaries, to learn how to really reconnect with and prioritize yourself, and ultimately gain and regain control of your life. We'll be working on aligning your values and your priorities getting rid of those outdated limiting beliefs that you may have that are likely the reason why you are blocked in one of your areas of flow. We'll also go through each and every area of flow, so all five of them, to really help you be able to flow and flourish effortlessly between your personal and your professional life. So if you are looking for some help in managing your capacity and really being able to have balance between your personal and your professional life, then go directly to my website so that you can book a free discovery call so we can see if the coaching program is a good fit for you. Okay, so today's episode is appropriately titled, It's the Awareness for Me, the Under-Discussed Alcoholism Epidemic. And I'm going to be talking a lot about what exactly alcoholism is, some of the different risk factors because many of us, whether we know it or not, are actually predisposed to alcoholism. I'm going to talk a little bit about the different impacts that it has in your health flow, your cash flow, and of course your heart flow. And I also want to give you some red flags to look for in case you or someone that you know or love may be suffering from alcoholism. And of course, last but not least, you know I do not leave you without tips. So I'm going to be giving you some tips on 
what to do if you find yourself or someone you love in this particular epidemic. So what exactly is alcoholism? And you know I love definitions, so depending on which one you click on in Google, you'll find a variety. And it really is considered a disease or a condition that in general results in significant mental or physical health problems from drinking alcohol. So feel free to Google yourself, but just that's the holistic definition of alcoholism. Now, the reason I'm calling it an epidemic and an under-discussed epidemic is because over 85,000 people in the United States alone die from alcohol, whether it's alcohol poisoning, a domestic violence-related alcohol situation, kidney disease, liver disease, heart disease, any of those things. Alcohol is the root cause. And so that's literally more people that die from alcohol-related deaths than people who die from the opioid epidemic. And we hear all the time in the news, in the media, all over the place about how the opioid epidemic is taking a toll on the U.S. But how come we don't hear about it like that for alcoholism? The actual more specific number is around 88,000 people per year that are dying from alcohol-related deaths. And when you break that down to how many people are dying on a daily basis, it comes to 260 people a day. That's a lot of people. And alcohol-related deaths make up the third largest category or reasons why people die in the United States. Number one is smoking and tobacco. Number two is poor diet. And number three is alcohol. Like, that blows my mind. I believe there are a couple reasons why we are not hearing about this, why it's not being talked about, and why it is just this hush-hush epidemic. For starters, alcohol is the most available, widely used, and misused recreational drug in the world. Yes, it's a drug, okay? And on top of that, it's a hundred billion dollar industry. And so you would think that with the significant amount of people who die because of alcohol, that there would be more of a conversation happening, right? But there's not. And the fact that over 17 million Americans alone suffer from alcoholism and only 10% of them get help, like that's a whole problem. And I know you hear the passion in my voice and I've shared frequently about my experience with my husband, but what other people may not know is that Both of my parents suffer from alcoholism. And that's no shade, right? Like, I love my parents. Everybody has their vices. But alcoholism is something that is literally embedded in the fabric of my family. And I've seen the way that it tears families apart, that it kills people, that it just literally wreaks havoc on families. And so the fact that so many people are suffering from this and we're not talking about it, is a problem for me. Before I jump into some of the red flags and talk about some of the implications and how it impacts the different areas of flow, can I just say that there is a such thing as a functional alcoholic? And I know that now we're not calling alcoholics alcoholics. Yes, I'm using air quotes. We're saying that it is technically, or the PC term is, someone who has an alcohol use disorder, or AUD. I just want to put it out there that out of the 17 million people in the U.S. who secretly struggle and suffer from this disease, a good one third of them are functional, meaning they get up, they go to work, they have really good high paying jobs, they're not really in trouble with the law, they are just really doing the things that they need to do on the outside, but behind the scenes, They're secretly struggling with cravings and trying to quit and obsessive thoughts about their next drink, which is what leads people to be caught in the alcoholism cycle. Speaking of cycles, I want to start and talk a little bit about some of the risk factors for becoming an alcoholic or suffering from alcohol use disorder. 
because I mentioned earlier in the podcast that you may be predisposed to this and you might not even know it. And so there are four main risk factors that I want to share with you today. The first one being your environment, specifically if you have a parent, a sibling, or a close relative that suffers from alcoholism, you are three to four times more likely to become an alcoholic. Think about that for a second. I mentioned to you that both of my parents have struggled with alcoholism. And so that means that between me and my nine siblings, we've all been predisposed to be three to four times more likely to struggle with alcoholism. And then when I think about that from a hereditary perspective, I learned while my husband was going through his ordeal that you can pass that gene down right? Like you can inherit alcoholism in your genes based on your family history. I know I've joked with other friends, family members, co-workers about how everybody has that one drunk uncle, right? Or that one drunk cousin or auntie or person who you just don't invite over for the holidays because they drink too much. But think about how that impacts you and the rest of your family. So being exposed to that and having that literally in your DNA can have an impact on whether or not you struggle with alcoholism. So that's number one. The second risk factor is your mental health. So those who suffer from depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, those sort of mental health conditions are at risk for being or struggling with alcoholism. And that's primarily because as somebody who is an occasional drinker, I know that I've used drinking wine or my favorite cocktail or whatnot as a coping mechanism. And oftentimes when you are struggling with mental health conditions, it puts you at a greater risk for becoming an alcoholic. So if you have any of those conditions, you want to be mindful of your alcohol consumption, your alcohol patterns. And just so we're clear, this does not mean that you automatically will become an alcoholic or suffer from alcohol abuse. It just means that you are at a greater risk of developing this condition or disease. So don't shoot the messenger, okay? I'm here to drop knowledge, to raise awareness, and all of that good stuff. Okay, so let's go to risk factor number three. I found this one kind of surprising, but it is having low self-esteem. So if you struggle with low self-esteem, that too puts you at risk for struggling with alcohol. As somebody who has struggled with low self-esteem, I can attest to that. Again, I've had depression and anxiety and low self-esteem, and I can remember trying to drink my problems away and trying to even in high school, drink to fit in sometimes. So if you have the awareness that self-esteem is something that you're struggling with, I want you to really be mindful of these other factors and how all of these can kind of play together and create the perfect storm. And last but not least, the fourth risk factor that I have for you is high levels of stress. Okay, so let's pause. I want to take a quiz really quick. And part of this comes from the capacity calculator and kind of how I built that out. But if you are a parent to a child or a fur baby, if you work a full-time job and or you have a side hustle, if you have a significant other, if you said yes to any of those things, automatically you got stress, right? Probably high levels of stress because I know I joke with you guys all the time about how this six-year-old be trying to take me out. And then I have this almost grown baby girl who will be 18 in May. And that's a whole level of stress that is just like, oof, right? And don't add having a significant other. Like, it's definitely a blessing. I'm not saying that it's not. But that comes with the good, the bad, and the ugly as well. So again, if you said yes to any of those things, newsflash, you're managing some stress. And if you have a high level of stress or you're exposed to or constantly under stress, 
you're at high risk for alcoholism. So keep all four of these risk factors in mind as you listen to the rest of this podcast. Let's talk a little bit about how alcoholism can impact you in the different areas of flow. And really, it can show up and it does show up in each and every one of those areas. But because we are still talking about financial literacy, I want to focus in on how it really impacts your cash flow because it spills over into your heart flow, into your work flow, and definitely into your health flow as well. One of the ways that alcoholism can kind of show up and impact your cash flow and in your finances is through unmanaged spending while you're a little tipsy. Now, who else has been on Amazon, done a little shopping after they've had a few drinks? I know I'm not by myself because I've done that. Or how about, and this is from me watching Bar Rescue way too many times, (laughs) so bear with me, but... How many times have you been out or when we could go out when the world was open and you were out drinking, whether it was at a bar or at a get together, and then you start spending money on not only more drinks, but more food. And it's a science to that, right? Again, that's the bar rescue. Depending on what you're drinking and how much you're drinking, you're going to want something salty or sweet or whatever it is to go with that drink. Point being is that not only are your inhibitions lowered in a variety of different ways when you drink, but that also impacts your pocketbook. There are countless studies that show hundreds of thousands of people admit to splurging on shopping while they were under the influence. So that's one way. Another way that it shows up is actually kind of combined with your workflow because unlike the functional alcoholics or those who suffer from alcoholism, when stuff gets bad and it hits the fan, it really can impact how you show up at work. So your productivity, your ability to get to work on time and complete projects, all of those different things. And if it gets to a point where it's significantly impacting your work, of course, that can lead you to getting fired, which really takes a toll on your finances. Nothing more devastating than losing your income, right? And I've seen this firsthand too. I've shared bits and pieces of my story around my husband's struggle and I've gotten his permission to share this. So don't nobody think I'm just putting him out there. We've talked openly about this. We saw this because he was terminated from a few jobs because of his alcoholism. And so imagine the devastation to me as his other half and the embarrassment, the shame, the frustration, the anger. And I wasn't even the person with the alcohol problem. And so it just blends into so many different areas of your life. But definitely alcoholism can impact your finances in a variety of different ways. And so the third and final one that I have is increased medical expenses. And I had a couple of stats for you on how much we spend in the U.S. on medical services when it comes to alcoholism. And I believe the number was like $282 billion that comes from the government and taxpayers to pay for treatment, to pay for prescriptions, just all kinds of things. And so if you struggle with or you know someone who struggles with alcoholism, it eventually will take a toll on their health, specifically Alcohol impacts your brain, it impacts all of your vital organs, right? Your heart, your liver, your kidneys. And excessive drinking over an extended amount of time is what leads to that 85 plus thousand deaths every single year. So not only is it impacting your cash flow, but it's impacting your heart flow. It's impacting your workflow in so many different ways. And hear me when I say you don't actually have to be the alcoholic to suffer from these. Because on the receiving end, I firmly believe that a good chunk of what I was dealing with secretly and suffering in silence with is what landed me in ICU. Because the stress, literally the stress that came from trying to keep on my mask, keep on my work face, be there for the kids and just all of those different things, it took a toll. 
So this isn't just for you. If you're listening to this, this isn't by accident. This is because either you or somebody that you know needs to understand that this is a real epidemic, but there are ways to really combat it. And so before I jump into some of those different tips, let's talk about some of the signs and symptoms or red flags of alcoholism. I've heard people say, well, I don't drink every day or I only drink in the morning or I drink just because I like the taste. That doesn't make me an alcoholic. So for starters, while there's no specific prescription that says, hey, if you do X, Y, and Z, then you're considered an alcoholic, I do want you to know that for men, if you drink more than four drinks a day or 14 drinks in a week, that is a huge red flag. And for women, it's if you have more than three drinks a day or more than seven drinks a week. Remember, there's no one-size-fits-all approach when it comes to this, but that's just a general frame of reference for you. So I'm going to share with you the top five that I've either seen, witnessed, read about, kind of combined, that I think would be helpful for you to pay attention to. Number one is making excuses to drink. For example, do you or have you heard someone say, I only drink because I need to relax, or I'm drinking because I had a rough day, or I'm entitled to drink because I work hard. That's a red flag. Because at the end of the day, and listen, I'm telling you, I'll have an occasional glass of wine. I do the wine Wednesdays, right? On Clubhouse. But I'm not drinking every single day. And I don't need it to relax. Is it a nice to have? Absolutely. But if you or someone you know or someone you love is constantly or frequently Making excuses to drink, that's a red flag. Number two is strong cravings. I'm talking about these intense cravings like, ooh, if I don't get a drink, I don't know what I'm going to do. I might hurt somebody. And kind of coupled with that, mood swings or withdrawal if you don't get that drink or if that person doesn't get that drink. So having these intense cravings and need to drink is another red flag that you want to pay attention to. Number three is a big one. And this is something that I saw growing up. It's something that I experienced in my marriage. So I know about it (laughs) firsthand, unfortunately. But it's when the person drinking continues to drink, even though it's causing problems at home, at work, or with friends and family. So regardless of the trouble that it's causing, whether it's DUIs or warnings at work or your significant other saying, hey, babe, I think you got a problem or people having these intervention type meetings and you still continue to drink or they still continue to drink. That's a huge, huge, huge red flag. So don't ignore it. Number four is drinking in secrecy. So you're hiding the fact that you're drinking whether it's being hidden from a significant other, from a friend, a family member, if you're doing it secretly and you don't want anybody to find out about it, that's a telltale sign that this is a bigger problem than just needing it to relax. And last but not least is you notice that there's a higher tolerance. So it used to take, I don't know, a can of beer, a glass of wine, something like that to just feel a little bit of a buzz. But now, in order to get that same level of buzz, you got to drink a whole six-pack or a whole bottle of wine. And oftentimes, we just equate it to, oh, maybe it's a different brand, so it's not as potent. But the truth is, when someone drinks so frequently, their tolerance level is increased Because their body needs more of it to be able to feel that same feeling. And so if nothing else, paying attention to yourself or the people around you that you love and being able to say, hey, I noticed this about myself or I'm noticing X, Y, Z about you and I'm worried about you. Being able to be aware. That's why I said it's the awareness for me. 
Because my stepdad used to tell me all the time to be aware is to be alive. And it's the same when it comes to managing this epidemic of alcoholism. Too often, many of us are struggling by ourselves because we're embarrassed, because we're ashamed, because we don't want to look a certain way. But it's too many of us doing that. And it's too many of us who are dying. Over 260 of us a day to be exact. So we got to get better. We got to do better. Now let's talk about a couple of the ways that you can either help yourself or help somebody that you love who may be exhibiting some of these red flags. The very first step is to really recognize your role. So whether you are the person who is struggling with it or you are a close friend or family member, understanding your role is going to be key. Because for me, that was number one, recognizing that I was enabling a lot of different behaviors. I mentioned that my other half lost a couple of jobs. He'd also gotten a couple of DUIs. Honestly, the first time he received a DUI, I was in denial. I don't know if it's because I was super pregnant with our son Liam at the time or what, but I just kind of dismissed it. And then when he lost his job the first time, Of course, I was angry, but I still was in denial and thinking, you know what, maybe it's just a fluke. And so really understanding if you are enabling the behavior of the person that's close to you that's struggling with this. And on the flip side, if you are the person and you identify with some of these symptoms that I've talked about, what are you going to do about it? So the second one is to make a decision to address the situation. That's whether, again, you are the person who is struggling with the alcoholism or you are the enabler. You have to decide to talk about it, to address it, because you cannot fix what you will not face. Pretending like it doesn't exist, pretending like it's going to go away on its own, none of that is going to get you on the other side and really be able to deal with the issue at hand. So make a decision to really address what's going on. And then number three is to get outside help because I guarantee you, I don't care if you have a psychology degree and you're a therapist, honestly, you need some outside help. The person that you love needs that outside help. You know how it is. Oftentimes, The people that we talk to every single day don't really take heed to what we say. But when they hear from somebody else, it's like, wow. And that's just a piece of it. But the other part is that it's above your pay grade. And I mean that with all due respect, ma'am. Like, there's nothing wrong with getting somebody who specializes in addiction treatment, in alcoholism in really not only the behavioral piece, but the mental health piece as well. Because I told you earlier that if you have mental health things going on, so depression, anxiety, all of those things are treated in so many different ways. And alcoholism, again, is a disease that's treated in a variety of different ways. So don't try to do this on your own. You do need some outside help whether it's your pastor that's praying for you or resources on helping you to detach with love, this isn't something that you should or can do by yourself in a vacuum. And as you're getting outside help, I want to share a couple of different resources that I know have been beneficial for me, for other clients that I've worked with, and just in general doing research. So the first one is to Really seek services from your local behavioral health center. Oftentimes, treatment is covered by insurance. And if your significant other has a short-term disability plan or a friend or family member, make sure they're connecting with HR. Yes, my HR wires are touching and showing. So know that there's a way for you to get treatment or for the people that you love to get treatment that's covered by insurance. And it's confidential. They cannot tell your job why you're out. 
So their resources starting there. Additionally, seeking out Alcoholics Anonymous. So they're at www.aa.org. And I know this has been a cornerstone in my husband's recovery, and it still is. And they have a ton of resources on codependency, on, you know, dealing with the trauma of loving and living with an alcoholic, just so many different things for you at your fingertips. So reach out to your local AA as well. And then last but not least, there's another organization called the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And they're at www.s as in Sam, A as in Apple, M as in Mary, H as in Health, S as in Sam, A as in Apple.gov. And their phone number is 1-800-662-HELP. That's H-E-L-P. And I'm going to put all of this information in the show notes. But each and every one of these different resources are going to be a starting point. But I want to share with you one other thing. You cannot make anybody get help if they're not ready. And you have to be willing to set some boundaries about what you're going to accept in your life for your own peace, for your own health. So it's fine and dandy to have all of these different resources. But if you are the person who's struggling with this, you have to decide that you want to do better and take it 24 hours at a time, one step in front of the other. And as a loving family member or friend, you have to give that person the ability to make the decision for themselves. Because telling them to get some help if they loved you or if they loved the kids or if they loved themselves ain't going to cut it. Sometimes we got to let people hit rock bottom and it hurts and it sucks. But you can be there on the other side when they do decide to get help. So just know that regardless of the situation, there's nothing that you can do to make somebody else get help. And I want you to know that. Now, I know this episode was pretty heavy, but again, because of how many people are impacted, over 12% of the population in the U.S. specifically, it's so important that we start having these open and honest conversations. And I didn't even get a chance to touch on how alcoholism is impacting teens and those, even the preteens. So that'll be a totally separate episode on another day. But I just want to leave you with this. Regardless of the situation, you don't have to do this alone. There are so many people, organizations, myself, other people that are struggling with this. So you literally are not alone. Reach out and get some help. Talk to your therapist. Talk to your pastor. Seek some resources. Because struggling with this by yourself, as the person who is struggling with the alcoholism, or if you are a close relative, it takes just as much of a toll on you. So know that you don't have to do this alone. I'm always a DM, an email, some kind of message away. So don't ever, ever, ever hesitate to reach out to me because I know what it's like. And until next week, I pray that you have a wonderful week, that your Q2 is off to a great start. And I look forward to continuing to be your capacity coach and helping you to increase your capacity for sustainable success by creating balance between your personal and your professional life without ever having to sacrifice yourself, your family, and what matters most to you. I'll talk to you next week.